Hello and welcome to a pre-recorded balance point. Um, we are not having live worship tonight as uh, <laughs> I don't even know how to explain this, but we had a very long weekend here in Compton, California. And um, not us personally, mostly our neighbors. And uh, as a consequence, uh, we are just physically not able to even be awake during the time of the balance point broadcast and so what you are watching is pre-recorded we will resume next week with our live broadcast um, although we are going to have some format changes and i will get to those once we get past our um, lesson for tonight and so with that let's bow our hearts in prayer heavenly father we just come before your throne and we just ask for your grace and your mercy and your wisdom as we begin this new series on holiness here at Balance Point. We ask, Father God, that uh, we would be receptive to the words of your holy book. And that, Father God, that they'd be more than just words, but they would, in fact, O oh God, be life to us and life changing to us. As we, as a Balance Point community, seek to follow more closely after your son Jesus. And we pray this in the name of your son Jesus. Amen and amen. So today we are starting a new series on practical holiness. And I guess we should begin with the question, what does it mean to be holy? Is it simply being just a good boy or a, or a good girl? Is it simply don't drink, don't chew, don't date girls that do? Or is there something more to being holy? Looking at the word, we find that holiness is much more than just being a good boy or a good girl. Holiness is much more than just what you do on Sunday. You see, to be holy is to be set aside for a purpose. Let me repeat that. To be holy is to be set aside for a purpose. Let me give you an example that many of us are probably familiar with. Now, some younger generation may not necessarily be as familiar with this as those of us that are in our 30s and 40s. But when I was growing up, in our kitchen, there were two sets of dishes. There was the set of dishes that we used every day. These were just our normal dishes. But then, there was a special set. This was a set that came out for formal parties. This was a special set that came out during the holidays and special occasions. These dishes were set apart. One could say that these dishes were holy. Let me give you an example from the Bible. In the Old Testament, they had the temple worship. And at the temple, there were, of course, the necessary meat hooks and meat forks. There were the pots, there were the pans, there were the braziers. Out in the camp, the people had meat hooks and meat forks and pots and pans and braziers. The, the, the dishes that the people in the camp used were the same as the dishes that were used in the temple. But what was the difference for the dishes in the temple? Those dishes, those utensils, had been set aside. They had been set apart for the service of God. In this sense, I want to talk for the next few weeks about being set aside for God's use. And what does that look like on a daily basis? 
What does it look like if we are holy? Now, around the church, many words can be used interchangeable with holy. There is sanctify, set apart. Even the word church itself, when you go back to its roots, in the Bible, the church is referred to as the ecclesia, which simply means the called out ones. You see, the church is not the building that we meet at. The church isn't even this virtual sanctuary that we are receiving the word at. No, the church are the people who have been called out of the world by God. You know, it, remind, it reminds me uh, of a story, and, and this is from the Calvary Chapels, if I remember correctly. Um... It was like after a Sunday service, and, you know, when you go to church, you go to church as a family. You know, you have mom, dad, and the kids. And, and kids are going to be kids. And so, it's after the service, and, you know, they're having their time of fellowship, and everything is real cool and groovy. Whoa, did I just say groovy? Everything is really cool. And, and kids being kids, they're running around. That's what kids do. And one of the ushers, you know, went up to the kid and said, hey, hey, you know what? You need to stop running in the sanctuary. You, you need to stop running in the church. And the pastor, overhearing this, said, no, no, no. It isn't that the children are running in the church. It's that the church is running in the facilities. You see, we are the church. We are the called out ones. We are what is termed holy. Now, I've got to warn you at this point. At this point, everything I've said is, is cool and everybody's going to agree with me. But I've got to warn you, for the next several weeks, we are treading on dangerous ground. This subject is a subject over which churches have split. This is a subject that can easily be twisted so that we move away from the grace that God has given us and it can easily become a list of do's and don'ts. You see, this is the problem that the Pharisees had during Jesus' time. God had given his people Israel the law. And the law is good. The law is perfect. The law prescribed how the people were to relate to God and how they were to relate to each other. Even as far back as something as simple as the Ten Commandments. The first three commandments deal with God. And the last seven deal, actually the last six deal with how we relate to each other. And the last one deals with how we relate to our own hearts. And then there were the ceremonial laws. There were the cleanliness laws. There were laws that were designed to protect God's people from the dangers of the fallen world. And they were good. They are perfect. But here's the thing. Over time, people drifted away. And by the way, the law of the Old Testament was a law of grace. Now, a lot of people don't Look at the Law of Testament, especially when, when you read laws like, if you commit adultery, you're to be stoned. But when you look at the whole of the Old Testament law, it was a law of grace. It was a law designed that if it was kept, 
it would draw the individual to their God, and it would draw the community together. And even in that law, there was provision for failure. There were the sacrifices for uh, a sin sacrifice. There was a sacrifice for a trespass sacrifice. You know, the, the difference being a sin sacrifice is you went into it knowing you were sinning. Whereas a trespass, you may not have realized that, that, that you had gone off the deep end. And yet there was a provision in the law for the relationship with God and the individual to be restored. And then there was the fellowship sacrifice, which was a sacrifice to draw family, friends, larger community together. So the law was a law of grace. The problem was people drifted so far away from that grace. That when the Jewish people were allowed back into the land after the captivity in Babylon, they said, never again. And there began to be a process by which extra commandments were added to the Old Testament of the law. The, the concept was called building, around, building a wall around the law. And the idea was, by having these extra rules that kept you Way away from the law of God. You couldn't violate the law of God. And here's where the problem came. What was good and what was holy became a list of do's and don'ts. And the law of holiness that was given in the Old Testament turned into a law of bondage. The same thing can happen when we, living under the new covenant, living under the grace of the blood of Christ, the same thing can happen to us when we talk about holiness. It can become a list of do's and don'ts. Don't drink, don't chew, don't smoke, don't date, don't date girls that do. Don't wear makeup. You know, uh, um, don't wear jewelry. You know, do go to church on Sunday, Wednesday, and Saturday morning. And, and you get these rules. And this was a problem that the Pharisees had. And it was a problem that it stripped what was good. Stripped what was pure. Stripped what was an act of God. And turned it into something ugly and something empty. We in the New Testament can do that too. When we talk about holiness, we, we can get into this realm where we take the holiness of Christ that's been given to us and the freedom in Christ that's been given to us and turn it into something that's empty. Turn it into something that is a shell. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness, your holiness, in front of others so as to be seen by them. If you do, you, already, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Often, when we talk about holiness, even in the Christian church, it becomes a point of talking about what we do when we are in front of others. Holiness isn't what we do in front of others. Holiness is what we are when we're by ourselves in the morning looking in the mirror. Let me repeat that. Holiness is what we are when we're by ourselves in the morning looking in the mirror. As I said before, holiness, the challenge we're talking about holiness is that it can become something that's done on the outside without actually touching the inner person. It can become an external mental exercise without ever touching the heart and the spirit. You see, 
part of the point of holiness is that as we become holy as our Father is holy, as we work out the holiness that Jesus has put inside of us, if it's just a list of do's and don'ts, if it's just a list of rules, then what happens is that our insides are never touched. And it simply becomes an act that we put on. You know, do you carry the big Bible because, hey, you need a big print Bible? And you want to be in God's Word and you want to be immersed in God's Word? Or are you carrying a big Bible because you want, to, you want Sister Superior and Brother Wonderful to know just how sanctified and holy you are? Are you wearing a cross as a reminder of what Jesus did for you? And is, it, and is that cross acting as a reminder that each day we are to die to ourselves to become more Christ-like? Or is that cross for show? That's the question of holiness. So if that's the pitfall of holiness and talking about holiness, is there any benefit to being holy? Well, I hesitate to talk about benefits because, again, if we're being holy simply for the outcome of the holiness, if we're being holy simply so, so that God will reach down from heaven and pat us on the head and go, ah, that's a good boy, that's a good girl, and give us our Cadillac in the driveway and our mansion on the hill, if that's why we're being holy, then again, just like the Pharisees, we've missed the point of holiness. And so there are benefits to holiness, but we aren't holy. We don't strive to work out being separated. We don't strive to work out being different for God's use to for God to use us simply so we can get a reward. You see, if our goal for being holy is to gain the benefits of God, we have already failed in holiness. But with that in mind, there are benefits of being holy. One of the great benefits of striving to be more Christ-like is the development of the fruit of the Spirit. Now here's the thing about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit ain't for the person developing them. When's the last time you saw an apple tree chomping down on an apple that it grew? When's the last time you saw a grapevine drinking its, the juice from its own grapes? The fruit of the Spirit is what is developed in me, developed in you, for the nourishing, for the spiritual, for the emotional, for possibly even the physical nourishing, depending on how that fruit manifests, of the people around us. And as we seek to be holy, as we seek to grow in righteousness, as we seek to grow to be more Christ-like, that fruit of the Spirit becomes available. And what are the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, against which are so... There is no law. Let me tell you, the fruit of the Spirit is worth its weight in gold. And we should seek the fruit of the Spirit. We should seek more Christ-likeness. Lord, help us to seek that. Because there is benefit. You see, as we seek to live holy, 
First thing I'm going to tell you up front, there's going to be conflict. Okay? Folks don't like it when you're different. <laughs> okay? If you get too far out of, of, of that middle third that's called, quote, normal, folks don't like that. Folks don't get down with that. And so there's going to be conflict. People are not going to like the fact that you are striving to be set apart and to be used by God. But interestingly enough, that's a very small minority. What is more likely to happen is you're going to notice that as you seek to live with the heart of God, in my notes I originally put, as you seek to live the righteousness of Christ. But again, that you could get into those, that, that list of do's and don'ts. But if, if you and I are seeking, if we're seeking to live the heart of God, I mean, really live the heart of God, not, not do's and don'ts, but really listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit, listening for the 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 leading of the father if we really are seeking that here's something funny that happens our lives our actions our words will come into alignment with the laws by which god governs the universe and here's the amazing thing as we more closely align with how God runs the universe, most of our problems will go away. Now there's a benefit of holiness. Here's why. Because you ain't fighting against God anymore. <laughs> You're not fighting against God. And so, our problems will tend to go away. Because here, here's the reality about our problems. Probably 90% of our problems are self-made. And we make those problems by not living in alignment with how God designed the universe. And if we will just get to a point where we can live in alignment with how God designed the universe, 90% of our problems will go away. 9% of our relationship problems will go away. Why? Because we're seeking to live out the love that God has already shown us. And when we're living under the law of love, when we're living under the law of holy love, yeah, there are going to be some that don't like that. But you know what? There are some that just totally hate God. And there's not a thing you can do about that except separate from them and go on and live your life of love. So what can we say about holiness? Well, for me, holiness is another synonym for love. It's another way of saying love. Remember I talked about the Old Testament law at the beginning of this thing. And I said that the Old Testament law was a law of grace, a law of love. If we're living holy, we will fulfill all the Old Testament law and all the New Testament commands. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. Let me set this up. The Pharisees and the Sadducees have been after Jesus. They've been trying to trap Jesus in his words. <clears throat> and finally, they get together. Finally, the, the Sadducees get together, and so the Pharisees get together. 
And picking up in verse 34, And hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with a question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. If the Old Testament law was holiness, and the Old Testament law is summed up in love and, and love the Lord your God with everything you got, love your neighbor as yourself then we can say that holiness can be summed up as the law of love. If we are consistently and persistently seeking the best for those who are around us, and we are consistently and persistently seeking to bring joy to the heart of God in heaven, then we will be living holy lives. Think about that. We'll be living the holy life when we live the loving life. Second thing we need to see about holiness is holiness is a command. Holiness is not an option if you call yourself a Christ follower. Okay? You are called to be set aside. You are called to be available for God's use. It doesn't matter whether you have any skills. What matters is are you available? Holiness is a command. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. And that came from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. <laughs> But not only is it a command, but if it is a com but holiness is not limited to what happens when we're at church or when we're with other Christians. That passage there said, "Be holy in all that you do." Let me give you a, an example of holiness in all that you do. And I've told this story before, but it has so many applications, it's amazing. When I'm not pastoring, when I'm not, uh, when, and that's a bad way to put it. When I am working at my vocation, which happens to be currently a computer tech, but at the time of this story, I was a serials technician in a law library. Basically, I was a guy in the library that processed all the law books, all the law journals, all the, you name it, that came in and got ready for the shelves. And I have this belief that everything I do should worship God. Everything I do. And because of that belief, when I'm at work, I view what I do as an act of worship. And during this period of my life, I, I mean, basically, my job was to stamp, tattle tape, uh, spine label, all the, all the stuff that has to be done to a book to get it ready to be used in the library. Make sure it's accounted for, make sure we got all the order in that we were supposed to get. That's my job. Nobody's ever going to see the guy or the woman that does that in the library. They're hidden away in the back room. And so, if the job is done well or the job isn't done well, the truth of the matter is, in most library systems, it's such a big library system, nobody's going to ever. But I had made up my mind 
that every time I stuck a spine label onto a material, I was going to do it in a way that not only followed the library procedure, and which really didn't matter because I ended up being the one that wrote the procedure, but I decided that I was going to prepare the items in a way that showed care, that showed that I was doing this, not just because it was my job not, and I was paid to do it, but I was doing this as an act of love towards the God that I serve. And so I did. And the funny thing about a law library, at least the funny thing about the library that I worked at, was because of the nature of law books, if you wait long enough, everything in the library turns over. Because that's just the nature of how law books are published. And so after about three years, pretty much anything that was on the shelf was something that I had personally touched. And you could tell that the person, I'm not saying this to brag, but you could tell, if you looked at the shelf, you could tell that the person who was doing the process had taken particular care with how the items were processed. And one day, I happened to be in the area where the books are shelved, the stacks, which is unusual because I was the supervisor. And so, usually it was my students who were out in the stacks. And, and there was a, an attorney in the library, and, you know, I was doing, I forgot what I was even doing, but I was in the stacks, I happened to be near him, and he commented about how consistently and how nicely the books were processed. and. I just kind of made an offhand comment that, oh yeah, well that's because a person does the processing as a Christian, and they believe that as they process the books, it is an act of worship to their God. And the attorney turned and said, that must be one powerfully wonderful God. That must be a wonderful God that a person would come out of church and give the same care to their daily job as they give in church. I don't say that to brag, but I say that to say that as we live a holy life outside of the church, we bring a, a small piece of God's love into everyday life. And with that small piece of God's love, there's an opportunity to plant a seed. Or possibly water a seed. The next thing we see about holiness is that since holiness is a command, God doesn't tease us. So, if we're commanded to be holy, then we have been given everything that we need to be holy. In other words, holiness is doable. But we aren't going to be holy in our own strength. And the proof that we can't be holy in our own strength goes back to the passage that we kind of start with up in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you certainly, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were keeping the law externally. They were keeping the law in their own strength. The funny thing is there was nobody in that day who was better at keeping the law and the scribes and the Pharisees. And yet for all of the work that they did, it couldn't be said that they were holy in the eyes of God. 
Because you see, their holiness had become external. Their holiness had become something that they could do on their own. Okay? I have another story. And, and I tell a lot of stories on myself. Uh, because a lot of people are, are kind of embarrassed when, when, you know, they talk and they talk about some of the things that God's taken them from. But I remember there was a point in my life where I made a point to pray for Osama bin Laden. Now, if you're here in America, you got it. You're like, whoa, dude. You've gone off the deep end. But consider this. God loves Osama, loved Osama bin Laden as much as he loved the greatest saint. How could I pray for somebody who had killed thousands of people? Simple. God loved him and God said pray for them. God said pray for those who despitefully use you. God said pray for those who cause you harm. And I figured that if Jesus, while he was hanging on the cross in agony, could say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. How could I not pray for those that had harmed millions? I mean, hundreds, thousands. How could I not pray for those who are under the influence of ISIS now? How could I not pray for the gangbanger out doing drive-bys. How could I not? But you see, here's the thing. I, I don't do it because I have any strength. When I was praying for Osama bin Laden, believe me, the last thing I wanted to do was pray for Osama bin Laden. But the Lord said, pray for him. And I will give you the words and I will give you the strength. And so I opened my mouth and I prayed for him. When I pray for the terrorists, wherever they happen to be, whatever they happen to come from, whether it's gangbangers in the inner city or, or Islamists in the Middle East. My flesh says, I don't want to pray for them. But guess what? My heart says, I don't want to. But my father says, I've given you the strength to. Being holy is not something we do in our own strength. Being holy is something that we do out of the strength that God has given to each of us. See, the reason it's hard to be holy It's because it's hard to get our eyes off of ourselves. And especially in the times that we live in. And we live in a time of narcissism. You got Facebook, you got Instagram, you got selfies. I mean, gee whiz, think about this. We are the first generation to invent a stick that lets you take a picture of yourself. Think about that. But it's something that's to be expected. And the move away from holiness is something that is to be expected. It was written about almost 2,000 years ago. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 2 through 5. People will be lovers of themselves. All you got to do is look at the internet. <laughs> They'll be lovers of money. All you got to do is read the newspapers. 
boastful, proud, abusive. All you got to do is look at our government here in the United States. Disobedient to their parents. Have you taken a look at Juvenile Hall? Ungrateful. Have you taken a look at the Occupy movement? Unholy. Without love. Unforgiving. Slanderous. Have you ever taken a look at the Hollywood tabloids? Without self-control, all you got to do is look at spring break, which we're coming up on real soon. Brutal. Five o'clock news is all you got to look at. Not lovers of good. Treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. That describes our generation pretty well. And then we look at what goes on in a lot of churches. I'm certain even here at Bounce Point this happens. Having a form of godliness. Don't drink, don't chew, don't date girls that do. But denying the power of God. Okay, so if we're going to be holy, we need to know what holy looks like. We've talked about right now in this passage what the world looks like. Lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, pride, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanders, all those things. That's what the world is. That's what the world is. And that's just a sampling of what the world is like. So if that's what the world is, what does holiness look like? Holiness looks like love. Love God with everything you got. That's the first commandment. And the second commandment is love those around you as you would love yourself. So what does love look like in God's economy? Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Whew, there's a tough one for me. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, 4-8. So how is holiness achieved? First off, Christ must live in us. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's first Col that's uh, I'm sorry, Colossians one twenty seven. Second off, you can't earn it. Holiness is a gift. I'm going to close with this. Hebrews chapter twelve. Verses 14 and 15. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will seek the Lord. See to it that nobody falls short of the grace. And that's why I brought us here. Holiness is the grace of God. That's why I brought us here. Holiness is grace. Holiness is a gift. You can't earn it. You can't whip it up in yourself. It is a gift from God. And so I want to invite all of us to live a life of holiness. I want to invite all of us to accept the gift that God gave us called holiness and to live it out. And if today you have never accepted the gift of God. Here's what we're going to do. I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. If you never accepted the gift of grace of God, what's the grace of God? Very simple. Simple thing you got to know. We messed up. God fixed it. Okay? I'll get a little bit more detail. But we messed up and God fixes it. 
scripture tells us that if you believe that Jesus died for your sin, and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes unto salvation, and with the mouth one makes confession. Let me explain that. What's belief? Belief is nothing more than trust. Trust in your heart that Jesus died for you. What's salvation? Salvation simply means that we've been saved from death. We've been saved from eternal death, which is nothing more than the separation of us from God. <clears throat> What's confession? Confession is to say the same thing about ourselves that God's already said about us. And it's very simple. One, God loves us. It's the first thing you got to know. God loves us. Two, we messed up. Three, we owe a debt we can't pay. Four, the debt's been paid by Jesus. That's all you got to know. So if you've never trusted him, or you once walked with him, but you walked away, today's the day and you're the person you'll make the choice, and God will make the change. But without God, you can't. But guess what? God's already, he's already done it. The scary bit is, Without you, God won't. God's not going to force his way in. So if that's you today, I want you to bow your heart and pray this prayer with me. And then we'll have another step right after that. Father God, I know that you love me. And Father, I mess up. I go the wrong way. I do the wrong things. I love the wrong things. But Father God, today I turn away from all of that. I know that I owe you big and I can't pay you. But I know that you also sent Jesus to pay the price for me. Thank you for sending your son. Now, Father, send the Holy Spirit to live inside of me. To guide me. To grow me. To mold me into the person you want me to be. Thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to contact me by sending me an email at staff at bounce-point.org. That's staff at bounce-point.org. In the subject of the email, put new believer, new commitment. The reason why I want to do this is because where it says that where two or more agree about a thing on earth, it shall be established in heaven. You're one. I'm one. I want to come into agreement with you. This is what you're doing. Okay? This email that you're going to send me doesn't save you. The prayer you pray, the belief you just confessed is what saves you. But this just acknowledges. Because the word says that if we will confess him before man, he, that is Jesus, will confess us before God. Now I'm a man. And it's if you can't confess Jesus before me, there's no way that you're going to live holy out in the world. It just isn't going to happen. So, send me that email. Next up, I said I had some announcements. First announcement is two weeks from today is Easter and we will be having a special Easter service, special Easter message. Um, in fact, this, the Easter message is actually part of our holiness series. And uh, we're going to talk about the gift of holiness that Jesus gave us when he died on the cross and rose again. So join us, especially in two weeks, at our usual time at 7 p.m. And be sure to invite a friend, invite a relative, huddle around the computer, or if you're watching this, you know, via uh, YouTube on your smart TV. Gather around a bunch of people around that smart TV and um, hear a message about hope. Second thing up, um, we are going to be doing some um, changes to our format here at Balance Point. Uh, one of the big changes is we are going to discontinue having live worship uh, not like the worship music but you know doing the music as part of our balance point uh, uh, 
webcast. And part of the reason why we're doing that is one, to shorten up that webcast just a little bit, um, especially for those that are coming to it Sunday evening as they need to prepare to go to work on Monday. The other reason is by not having that live worship, uh, it actually will make it a little bit easier on me to minister to you, the Balance Point community. Now then, that said, if you are in the L.A. area and you have a skill with music, singing, and you would like to help out with Balance Point, we could use your help. Uh, because if we can, if someone is willing to step up and take over leading the worship for, for the Balance Point broadcast, we will bring the worship set back into the Balance Point webcast. Um, the other thing is, if uh, you have skill, technical skill with video, audio, audio mixing, video mixing, we could also use help with the technical side. And um, so we are continuing that. We also want to mention that we are continuing to seek God as a church plant. And if you consider Bounce Point your church home, you've been attending here um, Maybe you've been downloading the webcast, you've been downloading the notes. Uh, we would love to have you as part of the Bounce Point family. And doing that is as simple as going to our ministry center, and the uh, address is right here at the bottom of the screen. Go to our ministry center, register, send you out a welcome letter for the registration, find out you know where you're at, what you're you know, what you're looking for in a church and We'll kind of go over what we believe, and, um, well, not kind of. We will go over what we believe, and at the end of that process, if you want to become a member of the Balance Point family, uh, you will be invited to become a member of the Balance Point community. Uh, we are working towards building a local congregation here in the Willowbrook area of Southern California. For those of you that are a little bit familiar with SoCal, but you don't know where Willowbrook is, we are in the area that is right smack between the city of Los Angeles, the city of Linwood, and the city of Compton. That's where we are. And so th this is a very central location. Uh, we consider planting somewhere else. However, because this is so central, and when I say central, I mean literally everywhere that you can be, within L.A. County and a good chunk of Orange County is only 30 minutes away from here. And so we're, we're going to plant here and we're going to stay here right here in Willowbrook and we're going to stay right online. Um, again, and you can get more information about that by either emailing us at staff at bouncepoint.org or, or you can register up at the Bounce Point website. Don't forget, normally we do have uh, worship at 7 p.m. Pacific Time. And if you are not local to the Southern California area, you're welcome to join us in our sanctuary. And that can be found at balance-point.churchonline.org. That's balance-point.churchonline.org. And just feel free to join us. And um, we look forward to seeing you there. And now prepare to receive the blessing in the name of the Father, who calls us to holiness. In the name of the Son, who gave up and gave to us the gift of his holiness and his righteousness. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who guides us into all righteousness. May you go and live a holy, sanctified life throughout this week, until we meet in heaven. Amen and amen. Until next week, may God bless you.